This is Moderate Rebels. I'm Ben Norton here with Max Blumenthal, who is now a free man, at least physically free. I, I don't know what he's weighed down on in his con- in his conscience there, but a lot but, of Jewish guilt. <laughs> but Max has now had his bogus charges dropped. The U.S. government was trying to throw him in prison, not just for the two days they already did, but potentially for longer. And he won the case because they dropped it. And we'll talk about why, but we can say that it was pretty shady. We'll we'll just say that the Secret Service records mysteriously disappeared. And you can look here. We published an article at the Gray Zone looking at the case. And if you want to see some more of the details, which we'll talk about, but it summarizes it there. So, Max, let's just, how does it feel? I mean, you had the case dropped. This was the Trump administration was waging a campaign against you. I mean, it's... Um, it's a relief and it's a big relief for, um, Benjamin Rubenstein, Ben, who is the other Ben, um, who, you know, works in the world of esports and, uh, is the brother of Alex Rubenstein, who was embedded inside the embassy as a journalist and is someone who's contributed to the gray zone, <clears throat> done a lot of important work. And Ben, you know, was worried about having his career, uh, that, you know, uh, you know, in this world where he's sort of an entrepreneur, uh, be destroyed, have his reputation destroyed because he was accused of beating up an uh, older woman, a woman who's 58 years old. And of course, uh, I was accused of the same. So, um, this room that we're sitting in, um, I, this is where I was confronted by a team of DC cops, um, at nine in the morning on a Friday, um, right on the side of the house over here, there were cops, um, you can see them in this photo that we posted. That's, you know, I think there were five of them and then there was a paddy wagon outside and they had actually, a, a bunch of them had come in the kind of like the jump out car, um, which is like an unmarked car. I found out later I was listed as armed and dangerous. And then, you know, jail going to central booking and then to the court jail is a pretty agonizing experience and, you know, physically agonizing, um, but very eye-opening as well because you see how the new Jim Crow functions, you know, up close and very intimate way. But, uh, you know, I feel like it's frightening and upsetting that a Venezuelan opposition member can make an accusation that's totally false against a political enemy. And this is obviously uh, part of a wider plan that they had to accuse me because I was ID'd on the night of May 8th with Ben um, delivering food and sanitary supplies to the activists inside the Venezuelan embassy who are there completely legally, um, that they can just make up this allegation and essentially have me swatted. I mean, that's not that much of an exaggeration considering I was designated as armed and dangerous, that the cops actually threatened to break my door down with a battering ram. Well, let's talk about that for a second. Is it only, I think, 3% of cases are marked armed and dangerous? And you have no precedent, no violent record. I mean, this is absolutely ridiculous. According to the National um, Crime Institute or the National Crime Information Center, only, yeah, right, only 3% of arrest warrants contain that label of armed and dangerous. And that's for people who have a prior record of homicide or, uh, or on the run for a violent offense. Um, so basically if the cops had shot you, they would have been justified because you were marked armed and dangerous. I don't know. I mean, we, we, uh, made sure to document, I mean, I documented the incident and if they had shot me, it would have been, um, obviously unjustified, but it was a frightening 20 minutes. They had to follow me through every part of my house. I came down to answer the door and I wasn't exactly ready to leave the house. I had to put on clothes. Then I had to, um, you know, take all the shoelaces out of the shoes I was going to wear. Um, I didn't know where I was exactly going and they sort of lied to me and said I was going to be out by dinner time. They just wanted to, we're just, we're just want to get you to court. Um, and you know, you get it, it just, the whole experience is very, agonizing, but the 20 minutes that they were here was extremely frightening. And, uh, one of the cops was really, uh, anxious and jumpy. And I was worried about what they could do. Um, I actually was held at gunpoint once by a DC cop. Um, I'd crossed over two yellow lines on Georgia Ave, returning a video parked in a parking lot at a supermarket. And the next thing I know, the cop is, uh, 
standing outside my car and I'm outside the car and he says, show me your registration. And apparently I reached for the registration too fast and I look up and he has his gun pointed at me and he's about to shoot me in the chest. So I've had that experience before. Um, Officer Norris from 4D, fuck you. Uh, <laughs> And then, and then he th throws my friend on the hood of the car and jails him. So DC cops, you know, they, they don't have the same reputation as cops in like LA or St. Louis. There aren't as many, um, officer involved hum shootings here that you hear about, but I have had terrible experiences with them. So that was a terrifying 20 minutes. Um, and then prison was another story. Um, but basically what the point I wanted to make is that it, this could happen to you. This could happen to anybody watching this. This opposition movement had total impunity. They're completely protected by the U.S. government because the U.S. government is literally paying the salary of their master, Carlos Vecchio, who's the former ExxonMobil tax lawyer, who is now the fake ambassador of Juan Guaido in Washington, D.C., who just set up this phony you know, regime change caucus with uh, Mario Diaz-Balart and Debbie Wasserman Schultz. And they just run around accusing all their political enemies of assaulting them. The most recent one was Code Pink founder Medea Benjamin. Um, I don't know if you want to pull up that video, but at that press conference on the on um, Capitol Hill, Carlos Vecchio is standing right there behind Debbie Wasserman Schultz, and Medea and some of our friends from the Embassy Protection Collective and Code Pink are protesting this press conference, protesting brutal, lethal sanctions on Venezuela, and. Vecchio's minions start choking Medea Benjamin and she's being pulled down by her throat. You can actually see Vecchio push her a little bit and Debbie Wasserman Schultz starts to get pulled and she says, call the Capitol Police. Bah. And the next thing you know, the police, you can show it. This is what it was like for me. They show up at Medea Benjamin's house. She live streamed it. They didn't even have a warrant. They're just like, well, somebody said you assaulted a congresswoman. So we're coming to your house. So you can see what they're doing. It needs to be stopped. We have to do something to hold them accountable to prevent this from happening. So I'm exploring my options for to hold these liars accountable from the Venezuelan opposition and others who have defamed me online. Yeah, and I also mentioned in, in the article I wrote about this for The Gray Zone, they mentioned a similar incident and a friend and colleague of ours, Wyatt Reed, tweeted about this where Carlos Vecchio's, I mean, he's, this is what he wrote, his, his goon assaults me, steals my phone, and then says, he threatens Wyatt saying that he'll end up like Max Blumenthal and Ben. So clearly, you know, the opposition, these, these right-wing fanatics know that the government is on their side, the government's protecting them, and that they can imprison their political opponents with the, all they have to do is make a fa false accusation, and they'll, they have the Secret Service acting as their own private mercenaries. I yeah. mean, it's so clear. So first of all, just to put the Venezuelan opposition in context, um, the the diaspora opposition, because um, this was an operation. And the, we entered the embassy with the permission of the Venezuelan UN-recognized elected government. In early April, we started doing, you know, there were concerts, there were um, different kind of like teach-ins, and it was a very peaceful atmosphere. Everybody was maintaining the embassy. Some people were staying over at night. And, and for a quick quick context, this was yeah. after Guaido's Kumongers took over the consulate in New York. So right. there were fears that the embassy, the official Venezuelan embassy in Washington was next. Right, right. So um, the legally, the Secret Service, who were operating under the auspices of the State Department, they didn't have the legal right to evict the people who were inside the embassy from the embassy. They just didn't, they, they couldn't do it. Um, they did not have the authority to even, to obstruct food from going in or whatever. And there was a guy who was outside who was posing as a homeless person, but he didn't look like a homeless person. He was always sitting out front with whatever activists were keeping watch. His name was um, Matthew Berwick, B-U-R-W-I-C-K. Um, and he turned out to be some kind of operative who was collecting intelligence. And ultimately, I think it was the night that, uh, or the day after the military coup on April 30th, that Guaido and Leopoldo Lopez attempted to launch failed. They brought out their goon squad, which consisted of 
a very seedy collection of Venezuela diaspora members who were willing to camp out around the embassy to use uh, violence, to use violent rhetoric and physical violence in order to do what the Secret Service, operating under the auspices of the State Department, couldn't do. And so it was pretty clear that collusion was taking place, that the right-wing Venezuelan goon squad, Juan Guaido's goon squad in Washington, was a proxy for the State Department to try to terrorize these activists until they left. And they obviously weren't going to leave. And they had, well, we all had lots of tricks up our sleeve, nonviolent, peaceful tricks up our sleeve. Um, and I think we kind of, I mean, more, it, we won a moral victory for sure. Um, but we also kind of won a you know tactical victory. Um, yeah. So talk about the phases because you're saying that yeah. at first the so the strategy was to take over these government buildings that belong to the internationally recognized Venezuelan government. And a quick point here, you know, we talked about this in our Jorge Ramos video. Take your trash, Jorge. Tú te llevas tu basurita, compadre. Son basura, son Agarra tu basurita, son, son Jorge Ramos. Son prisioneros. Agarra tu basurita, compadre. But we, we just talked about how. There's so often in the corporate media, there's this talking point that 52 countries recognize Guaido, but at the United Nations, there are 193 states recognized. So still nearly three quarters of the world recognizes the internationally recognized government of Venezuela. Yeah, but that's the like black and brown people of the world who don't count. <laughs> exactly. All of Africa, except for Morocco, all basically all of East Asia and most of South Asia, including India, the largest countries in the world, China. And anyway, so at the beginning, they took over the New York consulate and the Venezuelan embassy was next. And then you mentioned that after the failed coup attempt in, inside Venezuela, they start ratcheting up the violence. And then at, at what point do they actually besiege the embassy and prevent the protectors inside from getting food? So the idea is to starve them yeah, out. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so you have this right wing proxy force that's really acting on behalf of the U.S. government. We actually had... Um, reports from inside the embassy from different activists and journalists um, who were listening to the Secret Service as they uh, changed shifts. And one of them was uh, telling a new group of officers, um, this is the deal. The, the people inside the embassy and on that side of the street, the kind of protester side of the street, the anti-war peace activist protester side of the street, they're working for Russia or something. And the people on this side of the street, on our side of the street, they, they're U.S. government, referring to the Venezuelan opposition. Um, so that's how they saw it. And that, you know, that, 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 that was the dynamic. It was a Cold War playing out on both sides of the street, and the police were supposed to protect the good guys, you know, Rambo, John Rambo, um, whoever, Sylvester Stallone in, in uh, you know, Afghanistan, whatever, you know, those, his... De dedicated to the, the brave Mujahideen. Yeah, so those Venezuelans, <laughs> the, the cops were Rambo and the Venezuelans in their mind were the brave Mujahideen. All right, so basically um, a number of things happened. And, you know, I'm willing to, I'm, I'm free to talk about it now because this phony case against me was thrown out by the government and we'll talk about why. But, you know... Um, you know, for the first time, I'm free to talk about what actually happened. And there's no reason to hide anything. I mean, we didn't break any laws. The other side were the lawbreakers, international law and local DC law at every level. And that's extremely well documented. I mean, you can go online, social media. There's so many videos of these violent opposition coup mongers attacking, threatening, you know, spewing racist and sexist vitriol at all these people. And I actually saw a video of them sexually assaulting Ariel Gold. There's just like, it's yeah, just so well grabbed, documented. They grabbed her breast or something. Um, but if you were down there, I'll get into that. If you were down there, you were assaulted. I was punched in the stomach by one of them uh, as and Carlos in all cases, ran by. It's the embassy protectors assaulted by the opposition, which is backed by the Secret Service. Right. In all cases. Well, backed by the U.S. government. They're U.S. government, as the Secret Service guy said. Those are his instructions from above. So they, they, they show up like the day there's this failed coup in Venezuela. They try to surround the Carlota military base and attack it. And it winds up just being like 30. 24 soldiers. Yeah, 24 soldiers. Up. They put these blue bands around their their arms and they try to take over the country and it doesn't really work out. But they do accomplish one thing. They free Leopoldo Lopez, the far right opposition leader who was under house arrest for participating in numerous crimes and coup attempts. And, and many acts of violence, and they managed to free Leopoldo Lopez. And where does he go? 
he ends up in the Spanish embassy, the embassy of the country that colonized Venezuela. Yeah, so pretty appropriate. And, uh, you know, then you have these people in Washington who work for the, they, a lot of them worked in the, the defense industry, the World Bank. They work for all of these uh, heinous institutions here. And they're, they're, they show up and begin sort of verbally assaulting everyone, uh, using sexist rhetoric, anti-gay, anti-trans rhetoric, racist rhetoric against any black people they feel are against them. Um, it's just a, a, a racist, fascist free-for-all. Now, what had happened ahead of that, which um, was, was really strange, and I, I didn't quite know about it, was that a number of people who had been inside the embassy were afraid that they would be raided by the Secret Service before this mob showed up. They didn't understand quite yet that the Secret Service had no authority to raid. And so... Uh, because it, it violates the Vienna Conventions. It violates international law blatantly because a country's embassy is its own sovereign territory. Right. And, the, and, and you know, so, yes. And so they took a truck out or a car out with a lot of people's belongings and a lot of their food and supplies. They were so sure they were going to be raided. So there was a shortage of supplies. So by within 24 hours, this blockade of the embassy, which was sort of a microcosm of the blockade around Venezuela, had taken hold. And I was wondering, how long can they last out inside against this fascistic mob? And one of the issues just quite simply was not just food, but, but medicine. They were trying to obstruct medicine for older people um, and all kinds of sanitary supplies, toilet paper and things like that, clean underwear, just these kinds of things. And I thought that this was the most important anti-imperialist protest uh, I could remember in recent times since the Iraq war, and I wanted it to go on as long as possible. Beyond that, we had Anya Parampil, who's our very close colleague, and Alex Rubenstein as journalists who contribute to the gray zone and are part of our little, our own little kind of journalist collective here. And I feel like as an editor and a friend, it was my duty to see them uh, fed and so on. And, and and they're reporting live while they're in there. And you can find, especially Alex has so many tweets. He has videos, photos, documenting everything that's going on. At the Gray Zone, we published an excellent video from Anya Parampal looking at you know who the people were inside the Embassy Protection Collective. So they're doing constant reporting at the time. So yeah, so we needed to keep the reporting going too. They were contributing to us. And, and no one else in the world was because at first it was completely well, they were ignored. The only by, ones, they were all the only ones in the inside. And well, we, and also we have, it, was, it was ignored by corporate media. And then maybe you could talk about Vice tried to come. <laughs> whatever. We, we have to tell our own story uh, and, to, you know, to hell with the rest of them. So uh, the traditional peace groups consist of people who tend to wake up at normal hours and go to bed at normal hours. And while they were collecting lots of food and sanitary supplies, they were unable to get it in or even figure out a strategy. Um, I, as a night owl, was hanging around the embassy late at night, and I was probing the vulnerabilities of these opposition hooligans. So I'd go up to certain areas of the embassy or walk up to certain windows, or I would ask people to walk up to it, and I'd see how fast they would respond. Um, and we were working on lines of communication inside. It's it's like it's like football. You're trying to find like the opening so you can run and give right. the food to the people well, who are being besieged. Yeah, I mean, in football, in many ways, it's a it's a corporate sport, but it's also a very military sport. And uh, obviously, we are nonviolent. It was it was really important for us to remain nonviolent. I I just don't believe in it as a tactic. Um, so anyway, I you know realized that there was one major vulnerability um, where there was this ramp, this driveway, which many of the um, opposition activists didn't quite understand was connected to the embassy um, because the Venezuelan embassy had rented uh, a garage uh, from that, that connected to an adjacent apartment building. And there was a Secret Service van that the Secret Service used to bivouac there with police tape along the sides of it. Um, so one night... I learned there was going to be a heavy rain. Um, I gathered up 10 people uh, who were really uh, dedicated, 
You know, we talked before about, you know, no matter what happens, we remain totally nonviolent. If they hit us, well, fine. We just document it and we take advantage of the weather and the rain came down. It was a torrential rain. We ran, uh, up that ramp as soon as the rain got really heavy. We ran down that ramp as soon as the rain got really heavy. And there was a cop in the van, uh, but he was sleeping. And so when we knocked on the door um, to the with the embassy collective on the other side, um, the cop woke up and he was furious and he was he was like jumping around. And you know when you get up and you're completely discombobulated and he was, he tried to tackle people, but he didn't know who to tackle and he just fell on the ground. And then he got up and he said, all right, guys, he realized he had no legal authority to stop us. All right, guys, uh, you uh, you just go ahead and do what you got to do as fast as you can. So we got all the supplies in um, and bought them another few days, and also ensured that they would be, you know, medically safe and uh, you know have important sanitary supplies. They, the Venezuelan goon squad, didn't even know we came, but we knew it wasn't going to stay that way. Um, they had sort of decided to like bolster their defenses at night and they um, they started wearing those blue, they started wearing blue tape on their arms like the uh, coup mongers in Venezuela, who the 24 who tried to launch the military coup. And I would see them out by the garage, you know, and they'd have young men up at night just like standing there like zombies with their blue armbands on, just like waiting. And so basically by May 8th, uh, the food supplies were dwindling. Um, I got, I put out a call for people to deliver food, um, late at night and, you know, we didn't have weather on our side, um, but we did have, um, like 20 people who volunteered. And this is a really good display of kind of a lot of the different solidarity, well, solidarity, but a lot of the different, uh, factions of the left that are often at war with each other coming together. We had, you know, people from PSL and then you had anarchists and, you know, veterans for peace and, um, vet, veteran peace activists, but veterans for peace being people who served in U S wars abroad, um, coming together, uh, for a common cause. And so we all gathered at this, uh, outside this cafe in Georgetown and it looked like it, it, it just looked too hot. Like it wasn't really like the best place to meet. And I had to explain to everyone how it worked with the ramp at the garage and, you know, how we were going to execute the veterans for peace. I mean, these guys are in their 60s and 70s, so they um, mostly plan to lay a distraction in the front of the embassy. Um, and we had another friend, Jason, who had a uh, sprained f foot. Um, so he wasn't really walking that well and he was going to be part of the distraction and they were to go down, um, 30th street. And then we were going to go down 29th street and deliver the food when everyone is distracted, um, in the back of the embassy. And, uh, basically all th we went in three cars, me and Ben Rubenstein. And then we had two others in the car. Then there was the veterans for peace and a truck. And they, and then there's the the third car, which I would call the anarchist car, and the anarchist car didn't follow instructions. <laughs> oh, surprise of the century! <laughs> Who would have thought? Yeah, so the anarchist car went with veterans for peace down the wrong street, and laid the mother of all distractions, but left the four of us um, to contend with um, the goon squad in the back. But the distraction actually worked. And Jason got, I mean, you can see there's video of him. He got basically assaulted and thrown to the ground um, by these hooligans. He was choked. Um, you know, this is a guy who was obviously wounded already. And he was just tossed to the ground and choked. Um, there's video of these hooligans uh, threatening to beat people in the front. And they pretty much abandoned the back. So by the time... They got there. We had already dropped our bags and they were freaking out. They were really upset, but um, I didn't come into physical contact with anybody. I didn't even know who this woman, Nyalette Pacheco, was um, until I heard about this allegation. But basically, this is the 58 year old Venezuelan right wing opposition activist who apparently, according to multiple people who libeled you, was pregnant, which is a scientific miracle. Yeah. A 58-year-old woman who's pregnant. Yeah, yeah, I heard she uh, 
gave birth to triplets. Uh, <laughs> CNN reported on that. Um, and uh, one of them is named uh, Janine Añez. <laughs> so yeah. the other is uh, Janine Añez puppy, uh, Pipo, or whatever his name is, with a Burberry tie. <laughs> but anyway, yeah, so I, don't, I didn't know who this lady was. I definitely didn't come into any physical contact with any woman, uh, let alone anybody. And so wh what I personally did was I tried to run my, I had like a 50 pound bag of beans and, uh, I was holding it in one hand I mean, in, in two hands and I tried to run it down the driveway, but the secret service officers stopped me. So I ran back up and I had to just a clear path and I threw it down to Kevin Zeese, uh, Zeese for peace, who was just waiting at the door. It was like a perfect throw. It was just beautiful. It just landed right at his feet, just softly. And they needed the beans. I mean, the beans were like the the the, the main survival. They were like the Smurf berries. <laughs> and so that was it. We humiliated them. I mean, we we got it in. We got what they needed. And this was at the kind of the height of the siege when they had really put everything on lock. So they were really upset. They're really upset about that. And they were also upset that they were just losing the PR battle because we have our own media. Uh, we have alternative media. And that while they controlled the Washington Post, um, you know, Marissa Lang, the Washington Post reporter, would come down there and do this kind of identitarian framework for the whole thing of Venezuelans on the outside and elderly white people on the inside sounds... Uh, you know, like they're they're privileged and just ignoring completely the the politics of the situation. Yeah, where completely depoliticizing the, people the situation. Outside are right wing fanatics. They're bigots who are not only physically assaulting the embassy protectors and you all, but also spouting just all of this racist vitriol. And actually, the corporate media just entirely took their side of. I mean, it's not even just their side. They just distorted the actual facts. Yeah, I mean, Alina Duarte, who is our colleague who was reporting for Telesor for, for, for the, at the time, um, who, you know, is from Mexico and she was doing it. She was, she was out there all the time. So she was getting the most material. It was very damaging to the opposition. There's some incredible video. Um, you might not have it up right now. You could maybe like cut it in of this guy. Um, taunting her because she's mestiza and saying, you're an ugly India. I'm a, I'm a white man and I'm beautiful, bitch. And uh, she later came home and found that people had tried to break into her house and vandalized her, her, her house. And she wasn't even an activist. She was a journalist who was there She's publicizing what was happening. But of course, because she has a platform, especially in Spanish, they targeted her. So, uh, you know, the Committee to Protect Journalists has this guy, Avi Asher Shapiro, who said, like, he always used to troll us on Syria. He was part of that, you know, Syria regime change echo chamber. So he got kicked up to the Committee to Protect uh, Empire. <laughs> <laughs> he kicked, kicked upstairs there, and he actually told people, uh, you know, I'm. He told a journalist uh, who was around the embassy. I think it was Alex Rubenstein. I'm monitoring the situation. They didn't say goddamn thing. Nothing. They didn't say anything. So nothing. In any case, and and we'll get to it later. But also, these so-called press freedom organizations also, at first, completely ignored your arrest and said, "Oh, well, it has nothing to do with your reporting." Yeah, yeah. So, so anyway, the point is that the Venezuelan goon squad led by Carlos Vecchio, whose salary is now directly paid by USAID, was losing the PR battle, and they had failed to prevent food from getting in. So the next day, it was the same day, because this was at three in the morning that this all went down, they held a press conference where they alleged that assault had taken place. Uh, Nilet Pacheco was obviously designated to come forward and say that she had been beaten by uh, all these evil men. They, she said, uh, you know, I was in a fight for my life. Um, she said they kicked her and, you know, threw her against a wall and then tried to throw her over the balcony into the, uh, driveway. I mean, it was just completely absurd. I, I didn't even know who she was. And, um, Marissa Lang, you know, the Washington, the Washington Post, Post stenographer, st stenographer, uh, shows up and reports that several men attacked, uh, Nyalet Pacheco, 
they don't name who they are. Ben Rubenstein comes to the embassy that day and the secret service tackle him. He don't, he doesn't know what the hell's going on because he didn't touch anybody. Nobody touched any of them, but he gets tackled and thrown in jail for 20 hours. Um, because you know, the Venezuelan opposition said he, he, it's him. He did it. So, um, but weirdly they didn't come for me. They, they, they had me on camera with him and they knew who I was and I later found out that I was sort of suspect number two in his case, but they didn't put out, uh, their, their, the warrant for me was never executed, but okay. So this was May 8th. They made all these fake allegations. They got the police to issue this report. No investigation took place. No one came and interviewed me or anything. Um, no one interviewed Ben. They just threw him in jail, charged him with simple assault. He was going to trial. He's been going you know, on his way to trial this whole time. Meanwhile, um, this is one of the wildest parts of this saga is the D the DC city electricity utility Pepco shows up and I start hearing from Alex Rubenstein inside that, you know, these guys have opened up a manhole and one of Vecchio's, uh, minions, who's this guy who, who wear a, wears, wears a blue suit. He was always wearing a blue suit. He was like the Alex P. Keaton of Venezuela. <laughs> and, uh, like his, a zoot suit? No, so he always was wearing this blue, like, like, you know, like a used car dealer trying to look like he's a Brooks brother. <laughs> anyway, and his dad, his dad owned, runs this big libertarian think tank in Venezuela. Um, so you could call him like the, the Coke brother or something. But anyway, the, he's the, standing the with Pepco. Chi the Chicago chi Chiquito. Yeah, he's he's a proxy for this, the Trump State Department, and he's standing with Pepco, and they proceed to cut off the electricity to the uh, embassy, even though their bill was paid. And Pepco's communications director refused to answer any questions from anyone. This is this is crazy. It means that if the U.S. government tells the local electricity company to cut off anyone's electricity because they have a political uh, goal to you know flush that person out or whatever that they have to do it so no protocol was followed here N there were no rules and so with the electricity off the situation changed for everyone inside um, they Which were on is, is, is insane because it's an it's another microcosm of the imperial war in Venezuela where there were these blackouts that were very clearly caused by cyber attacks and then you know, the, the U.S. government claimed, oh, these aren't cyber attacks. But then at the same time, the U.S. government admitted in articles in The New York Times that it carried out cyber attacks targeting the electrical infrastructure of Iran and Russia. So it's very clear that, that the U.S. not only has this technology, but is using this technology. And the embassy was just a microcosm of it. Right, right. So, you know, perfect point, a uh, really good point. And so that changed the situation, for example, for Anya and Alex, who were recording the situation, documenting it with their phones. They can no longer charge, charge their phones, laptops, et cetera, um, new levels of, of danger to those who were inside. Um, but there was an ace card. Actually, there were several, there were two ace cards. The first ace card was that there were embassy vehicles but their keys had been taken out in that initial car when everyone thought they were going to be raided. So no one could turn on the cars and charge their phones or whatever using the cars. And the second ace card was that there was a fax machine that we found out the number for. So there was actually a landline to communicate with people inside because their hope was, oh, there's no cell phones. Well, then we can't communicate with them. So I said, what do you need? And they said, well, we need to, t we need to get those cars running. And we need to, um, we need some light. And I said, all right, I'll take care of that. I got the keys from, uh, an embassy worker, a former embassy worker. And then I got, I went to Best Buy and got these solar lamps. And then what I did was on the day of the, you know, big, they had this big street party. The, the Esqualidos, the right-wing Venezuelan goon squad had this big street party. And I'm like, that's actually the perfect cover when there's the most of them out there. And I sent a friend of mine who looks Venezuelan, who, you know, was coming from work and he dressed, you know, he was dressed like Juan Guaido, like a perfect yuppie. 
I gave him this big bag of of like smart pop or whatever pirates. I gave him pirates booty from Whole Foods, and I put the keys at the bottom of the popcorn bag, and the um, these solar lamps, whatever you call them, um, in there. And then we put popcorn on top of them, and then I sent him walking to that spot um, above the driveway. And told him, you know, at at this time you have to drop the bag there. But he was able to easily infiltrate the um, the, the the blockade because he looked like everyone there. No one suspected him. He didn't look like some you know aging white hippie or whatever. And uh, so he walks with the popcorn, and then he, I get a call from him, and he says, uh, "Max, uh, I didn't drop the popcorn because there's tons of cops down there. I think they're waiting, and they heard." They like, they, they heard your communications and I was like, all right, man, just go back, take one more like uh, trip around. And he says to me, all right, but I ate most of the popcorn. <laughs> <laughs> like, man, okay, don't eat any more popcorn until you get to that <laughs> spot, but look like you're really enjoying the popcorn. And then, uh, I get another call and he says, uh, I dropped it and I don't know if I got it in, but, uh, I saw these guys running and screaming all these, uh, you know, Venezuelan guys running and screaming. And, uh, it turned out that he dropped it in the perfect place. They got it in and the phones were active, uh, that day. In addition, um, the activists inside the embassy protection collective was able to make beans, even though they had an electric stove because they were cooking the beans on the engine block of the cars. Oh my God. So they were very <laughs> inventive. The next thing that happened. Well, this is also another great metaphor for the situation, another microcosm yeah. where yeah. every time there are these imperialist attacks, these these forms of hybrid warfare intensify against Venezuela, Nicaragua, Cuba, Iran, all these countries, the ingenuity of the people finds solutions to it. So in the case of Iran, you know, you frequently hear where, you know, people can't import medical goods in the case of nicaragua because of the brutal u.s economic warfare they became food sovereign so it actually forces people to be to be more creative and and productive in how they organize themselves yeah yeah so actually inside the embassy uh there was uh preparations for the next phase which was cutting off the water and so they began collecting Every every scepter inside the embassy, they filled with water. They began filling it on the roof. Um, you know, everything was set for the next phase. That's commitment. That's and, serious commitment. And they could have lasted even without another food delivery for weeks. So what happened was Jesse Jackson showed up with the Black Alliance for Peace. Matthew Berwick, who I had mentioned before, like you see him in every video and he's always wearing tactical gear and he looks just like just really creepy. He physically attacked Jesse Jackson and attempted to prevent, uh, he didn't physically attack him, but he grabbed him and tried to prevent him from lifting a backpack into the embassy, which they were going to hoist with a rope. And there's this great video. Um, you can cut it in and post of, a, of a, a Jammu Baraka, uh, basically getting, Matthew Berwick physically off Jesse Jackson. Keep him back! Keep him back! Keep him away! Keep him the right there! And by this time, the D.C. local police had replaced the Secret Service and they were unwilling to stop Jesse Jackson out of, re out of respect and even reverence. Um, the, most of the D.C. cops were black local cops and they weren't going to do that. So this freaked out the Trump administration and the State Department. And I don't know if it was the next day. I think it was the next day. Uh, they staged a military style raid on the embassy. It looked like Waco outside there and you had uh, four embassy protectors left inside. Anya had come out with the kind of original um, socialist uh, rendering of Simon Bolivar to highlight his indigenous features and she you know basically came out with it in her face and shouted uh, you know Viva Chavez in the face of, um, the Coke brother, who I mentioned before, <laughs> with his like blue used car the, salesman, the Chicago shooting. Chiquito. Yeah, 
the little Chicago boy. And then she handed the picture back to uh, the the cops who accused her of, and she was still never less accused of stealing it, even though she handed it back. But anyway, um, so also, there, that, that was the property of the Venezuelan government, yeah, yeah. which which said that the embassy protectors should take that property and protect it until they can restore their own rightful ownership over their and own without embassy. without a doubt they have destroyed and thrown out portraits of Hugo Chavez and Simon Bolivar um, so they've destroyed lots of property I'm sure but um, there were four embassy protectors left um, Kevin Zeese and Margaret Flowers who helped launch uh, Occupy DC uh, Adrian Pine they also run a really good website popular resistance Adrian Pine who is a anthropology professor at American University and David Paul who had come in from the Bay Area to um, to lend a hand and he really oversaw the the, the water collection <laughs> um, really was uh, a major asset and they were willing to get arrested uh, in, and they got arrested in this military style raid and are now facing a year in prison and I think hundred thousand dollar fines um, but even though it was actually the cops who broke the law by illegally invading Venezuelan territory and physically removing them and arresting them. But the people who broke the law are the ones charging the embassy protectors with breaking the law. It's insane. And and one of the most interesting things is that, uh, you know, they're being charged with um, sort of, I don't know what, what the charge is, trespassing or um, basically being on a property of a of a government without the government's permission. But the coup has failed. Juan Guaido controls no institutions. Carlos Vecchio is basically the head of the Venezuelan version of the right-wing Cuban Miami lobby. Uh, he's no longer really even pretending to be ambassador. Um, Juan Guaido is discredited. The Wall Street Journal has an article today about how Guaido has failed and the Venezuelan economy is gradually actually improving. Um, Juan Guaido, in a recent poll, the most recent poll, um, only 10% of Venezuelans trust him. <laughs> and keep in mind, this is a guy who, in on January 23rd, when the U.S. told him to self-declare president, and then U.S. allies all proceeded to recognize him as supposed interim president, a poll was done be three days before on January 20th that found that 87% of Venezuelans had never heard of him. So more than 80% of Venezuelans didn't know who this guy was. And then he was appointed so-called interim president by the U.S. empire. And then now 10% of Venezuelans actually trust him. <laughs> yeah, so it's been a complete failure. But the point is, the U.S. is actually dealing with the Maduro administration. And it's, so it's not just the U.N. that recognizes them. The U.S. has to, is dealing with them. They don't know what to do. And because the U.S. is dealing with them, it kind of takes the bottom out from the prosecution of the embassy um, four who are still facing prosecution because they're being charged with being in a place where they actually have the permission of the legitimate government. It doesn't make sense anymore. Um, and I think their case will help validate the fact that the U.S., in fact, even if it doesn't say it in its rhetoric, recognizes the Maduro administration as a legitimate government. But I want to talk about one final point or one final aspect of the whole saga surrounding the embassy, um, which is surveillance. Uh, we were under heavy surveillance, and it was a frightening uh, series of weeks. And at one point, I organized a meeting to talk about getting food in uh, several blocks from the embassy. And as soon as we arrived at the meeting, this is where I like picked up the keys that I was going to bring in or have brought in. Um, squad cars started circling and a, and a bunch of bike cops just immediately pulled up and stopped right in front of me and two friends. And I'm like, what are they doing here? How did they know I was going to be here? What's going on? Um, so it was pretty clear that there was surveillance. Um, but even more recently, something extremely disturbing happened where um, I was preparing my defense and we had loads and loads of exculpatory evidence, including video which has been you know, put on Twitter by the Venezuelan opposition, uh, which doesn't show me doing anything remotely wrong. Um, shows me, there's one video where, I'm, where you can see me like holding my phone and I'm walking away. Um, but uh, I had asked... Uh, someone who had filmed the 
um, embassy during the uh, May 8th food delivery to send me footage they shot, and they shot it on a traditional camera, not on a cell phone. So they sent me a flash drive of the footage. And when I received uh, this envelope in the mail, um, in my mailbox, a corner was ripped out. So the corner was ripped of this, and I found this slip inside, which is, you know, normal. Con contents, one 16 gigabyte flash drive containing video of scenes at the embassy of Venezuela, early AM, May 8th, 2019. Yeah. And I looked inside and there was no flash drive. Missing. It was missing. Um, and, you know, the FBI has a partnership with the U.S. Postal Service. They were even talking about it on Twitter today. I don't know what happened, but the flash drive was missing. We ultimately got the flash drive and I saw the footage and it definitely was helpful footage. Um, the government had no case against me, but this was extremely disturbing. Um, beyond that, you know, after the embassy, uh, there were, you know, some of the, the uh, peace activists outside and embassy protectors um, told me that they were harassed in the street by members of the Venezuelan opposition, that they were threatened there. Um, and this kind of force that's been weaponized by the U.S. government the same way that the U.S. government has weaponized right-wing Cuban exiles, um, that they have weaponized um, Ukrainian Nazi collaborators after World War II, um, is still lurking. And uh, so something has to be done to hold them accountable, legally accountable, to prevent this kind of episode from happening, happening again. Um, and to prevent the U.S. government from doing it again. So, again, I'm exploring my options, um, but it's a relief that, you know, at least this this saga is over. Yeah, and let's talk about the response that you've seen. So we definitely have seen a lot of support for the gray zone, people speaking out. And, of course, it's great news that the case was dropped. Let's talk maybe a bit about that. The Secret Service documents mysteriously disappeared. And these were documents that, including call records and print documents that would have potentially showed collaboration, proving state collaboration, collusion between the Secret Service operating under the auspices of the State Department and these right-wing, violent Venezuelan opposition folks. So clearly, there are some mysterious circumstances there that have not been explained and need further scrutiny. And yeah. then there's also... Well, the, just to clarify, these were the call logs of the night of May 8th when the supposed incident occurred. And they mysteriously disappeared when Ben Rubenstein's lawyers and my lawyer, Bill Moran, who really deserves special recognition. I mean, he's defended me at every turn without asking for a penny. He just does it on principle. And he uh, really helped get this tossed by um, demanding, for example, the call logs and pointing out that there was no evidence um, in communications with the government prosecutor. Bill Moran is the best, and Bill always wins. Bill always wins. <laughs> Bill always wins. That's actually his Twitter handle, <laughs> if you want to thank him <laughs> on our behalf. Yeah. Um, but uh, the call logs are significant because, you know, uh, Nilet Pacheco, who made this phony complaint against me and Ben Rubenstein, uh, she... Uh, apparently had the secret service call an ambulance for her that night. Why is there the call to the ambulance is not that it would be significant. What, what, what sort of injuries did they report from her? What were they, what, you know, what were the secret service officers saying? Well, what were they saying to each other? Um, those call logs disappeared and they may have been destroyed. And in the words of Carl Messinio, who is counsel to Ben Rubenstein, it's highly unusual and highly Notable, and as you said, it could. Yeah, that's point the quote to, I got from my article in the Gray Zone. It could, uh, it could prove collusion that we all already knew was taking place between these two elements. Um, but, and then talk about the response you've seen. I mean, we should definitely talk about the media response, and then especially these people who just defamed and libeled you. People who claim to be journalists who make money being supposed journalists who know that this is false information and they still have refused to retract their false accusations. It's just completely libelous. Yeah. 
Um, I did. I, I just finished, and I'm I'm really sapped from doing this thread of this <laughs> like monsters gallery, this monster squad of uh, regime change pundits who you know honestly they've been like hounding me for years. They're like they're like the you know political version of herpes. They just like won't go away, um, and they are really upset about me busting some of their Syrian regime change propaganda. And helping to, you know, mainstream the facts um, about the Syrian armed opposition, the Syrian opposition as a whole, and the sham that they were running. Every time I say Syria, Siri activates. And so I have to like hide her. I have to like put her (laughs) to death under here. But, uh, you know, it was really funny. Well, first of all, I got so much support when I announced that I'd been arrested and I was sitting in a cafe with uh, Bill Moran and Ben Rubenstein um, the day after I got out of jail and I noted, and then somebody was already going off on Twitter with my arrest warrant, Max Blumenthal arrested for kicking 58 year old woman. Um, Then I started to see people jump on it. Max Blumenthal arrested for beating pregnant woman, you know, the 58 year old pregnant woman. Uh, the, the biggest miracle since the Virgin Mary. And so all these people who've hated me for years and have been un- unable to, it's not just that they've been un- unable to shut me up or you up or anyone around me. It's that they can't even, um, they can't even argue with us on the merits of anything. They never do. So they never dispute the facts because what we report is factually correct and indisputable. So instead it's all ad hominem attacks. And then now we're at the point where not only are they ad hominem attacks, they're, ca- they're, spreading lies and hoping for you to go to prison. And these are people, many well, of them- the perfect thing. I can't tweet from prison. I can't write articles from prison. So you can't expose hooray. this crime. And many of these people, what's even more outrageous is they, they call themselves the liberal anti-Trump resistance. They're cheering on the Trump administration's attempt to imprison a journalist on fake charges. Yeah, so the, it had already leaked, which meant, you know, someone in the government had tipped the Venezuelan opposition or some or someone off about this. And the whole point of it was to defame me. I mean, it really showed what this was about, that it dropped uh, at prime time on Monday. It was like 5 p.m. when everyone's paying attention. So we dropped our article, which was totally factual and has been completely vindicated, like damn near everything else we write. And the support, the outpouring of support was very clarifying for me. It showed not just that so many people are on our side, it really did show that we have a really um, you know, strong community of people out there who understand what the stakes are and who are awake to how they're being propagandized, who are skeptical, who are critical-minded, who are really good citizens. Um, but they're also- And are super hungry for alternative media because yeah. even many of the few remaining alternative media platforms in this country have capitulated and given yeah. into this regime change lobby, yeah. which is so vicious, so vindicative, vindictive, so violent and- And petty. Though th- They want to destroy our lives in every way yeah, and, and they're revealed- willing to side with literal fascists to but, do so. But the, the other point I was going to make is that there were people who were willing to um, kind of support me on principle, even if they didn't agree with me, people more more close to the liberal side. Um, and so one of them was the New Republic editor, Jeet Heer, um, who said, you know, this is, you know, anyone who cares about press freedom should be worried about this, something basic like that. And he got piled on by the Syrian regime change fanatics, and they were you know, calling him a moron and saying, you don't know what you're talking about. Given the person in question, you should be uh, really exercising some judgment here. Like what, 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 who is the person in question? Like when have I really been exposed for lying before? It's all, and basically what they're building on was the dossier of, you know, uh, distortions of half truths and denigration and straight up lies that was first built up by the conservative movement, then the Israel lobby, and then the Syrian regime change lobby, and then the Venezuelan and Nicaraguan regime change lobby. <laughs> so they just have this giant dossier of um, smears, disinformation and smears about me that they use to throw at anyone like Jeet here who wants to stand up and just say that I am a journalist who should be defended on that basis. So they're And they're really afraid that anyone close to the mainstream will take anything I say seriously because it means 
well, wait a minute, then that means they might start to wonder that the white helmets are not who they say they are and that removing they're not just angels straight from heaven yeah that they're not just these life-saving volunteer you know oscar-winning volunteers um that you know maybe removing the Dama the government in damascus might be as harmful as removing the government in baghdad uh, or even worse those kinds of things so they're really worried about the mainstreaming of everything we've been saying and i've noticed that people refer to the gray zone now not just as an outlet but as a way of thinking which is synonymous with anti-imperialism, which they, they don't want to say that openly because they pretend like they're not pro-imperialist, but they are. It's like they, they absolutely are. Yeah, it's like how they don't want to... Yeah, so they also use the, the term tanky to avoid saying anti Yeah, including all these, these liberals now who have co-opted this Trotskyite term, which is incredible. But let's talk about... You said that they're afraid of you getting any mainstream coverage. Let's talk briefly... Well, and you as well and anyone close to us. Yeah, well, you did an interview with a friend of us, Katie Halper, who has a somewhat mainstream platform platform now with a great show, Useful Idiots, on Rolling Stone with Matt Tybee. They're both good journalists. Matt Tybee has also done, he's been viciously attacked like us, not as viciously, but because he spoke out against Russiagate, he's been smeared as the Trump in left. And, yeah. and so they had you on and it was a good interview. But after that, these insane Syria regime change trolls led a campaign openly saying that they want to get her show canceled. They're trying to get Katie Helper's show kicked off Rolling Stone because she dared to interview you and to talk about some of these issues. Yeah. Uh, it shows I, how censorious they are. We, we actually talked in the second episode about how we're going to be attacked and everything we predicted was fulfilled by just th these like sort of these jack in the box fanatics. They just like they just jump out of the box and say a variation of four things. It's kind of like the Krusty the Clown doll <laughs> yeah. uh, it, that, you know, it's like. Like, uh, hi, kids, you pull, you pull the string, <laughs> but you pull the string on them. It's like Idris Ahmad, genocide, genocide denier, denier. Uh, you were Hitler, um, Assadist, <laughs> uh, Putinist, whatever. You pull the string and they just say a few things, but one thing they CPJ, can't. CPJ. Yeah, yeah, one thing. Atlantic they, Council. Or whatever. One thing they can't do and they never will do and they didn't do on my interview with Rolling Stone is challenge me on a factual basis. They can't challenge the facts. And so. I mean, just watch the interview. Try to fact check me. It didn't. It they didn't even try. They just uh, they used their usual tactic of a kind of echo chamber swarm. And one, you know, and one interesting thing. I mean, this is getting a little bit off track from the embassy. That it made clear, and that this element made clear, was that um, in the way that they reacted to the death of White Helmet's founder, James Lemercerier, who was a British military intelligence officer who founded the White Helmets in Turkey and died either from suicide or he was killed Jeffrey Epstein style <laughs> uh, and who was experiencing some serious problems, not just in fundraising, but apparently in paying back bills. Um, Turkish media reported that he had had a huge fight with his wife in a restaurant the night before. I don't know what happened, but that James Lemercerier was really the central nexus of this echo chamber of fanatics. And who is James Lemercerier? He's someone who is raking in um, over the years, raked in like $100 million from the British Foreign Office and USAID, which was a CIA cutout created out of Bill Casey's. Well, I mean, the USAID Office of Transitional Initiatives, which was funding the White Helmets, was. And then they had this public relations arm, the Syria campaign, which also took in a lot of money from private billionaires like Ayman Asfari. But the point is, this echo chamber is not organic. Um, it's funded I, to the tune of literally millions and millions and millions of dollars. Well, it's not funded. I don't know if it's funded. It's that these people... No, in who, the sense that these institutions provide funding to but, but, but opposition let's, media but let's and talk the about the Atlantic trolls. Council. And, yeah. yeah, but let's talk about the trolls. I mean... The who work for many of these institutions. The, the, yeah, but some of them are just straight up losers who are struggling yeah. from work. True. And one of the things that unites them is their mediocrity. I mean, you look <laughs> at the, um, the fall... Uh, I don't know if there ever was a rise of Oz Katerji. I mean, this is a guy who is writing articles about like, you know, puppies licking ice cream cones for the Daily Mail. And then he's fired because he denigrated a coworker, Chris Peter Hitchens, on work computers. This guy just can't resist attacking people all the time. He okay. just can't get uh, ahead. I got, I got one up here. This is Daily Mail. By the way, the Daily Mail is a right wing rag that that is owned by a family that supported the Nazis and fascists during World War II. Here's, here's a masterpiece from Oz Katerji. 
Wipeout, incredible moment, jet ski rider rescues surfer from 50 foot wave, only for it to bear down on them and swallow them up before they emerge unscathed. By Oz Kotterji for Mail Online. <laughs> yeah, I mean, he's like the uh, the ultimate Keystone cop. I mean, he can't do anything right. He has He's not known for anything except harassing people. And, you know... Here's here's another classic from Oz Kotterji. Teenage girl is accused of decapitating her grandmother's pet and keeping its head in her bedroom drawer. <laughs> what? And heart, and heart in the freezer. This is this is the hard hitting reporting that that Oz Katerji was doing. Well, yeah, I mean, deep investigative reporting. He's obviously not <laughs> known for any reporting, but he's been everywhere. And you know, he's someone who, when Le Mercurier mysteriously died, he said, "You know, my friend is gone." And the point is, to the point is that these people who are mediocre, fail sons and daughters who can't get any, they just can't do anything. Like if you look at them on their own, the, the best they can do is write an article every four months. Um, they were eating or, out or of, a blog post attacking us with no actual evidence to just like alle- just empty allegations, whatever and Im- implications. But the point is they were eating out of the hand of James Lemercurier who had all of these opposition contacts who would get them their little toe tap trips to Syria to meet with the FSA and they could draw their little Ralph Steadman plagiarism uh, art or whatever uh, they could meet with the white helmets and go in with them. And actually when I called the Syria campaign for my expose on the white helmets, um, they uh, offered me initially a trip. James Sadri, who is their director, this pompous British guy, uh, offered me a trip. He's like, you got to come to, to to Turkey and see the real heavy gear, man. It's like he was trying to appeal to me as like a guy. Oh, yeah, the White Helmets have this heavy gear. They're awesome, man. And they save babies with the heavy gear. Like, bullshit, man. And then they realized that I was not, that I was skeptical of them. And so then they turned on me. The point is that you had all the the whole media, the blue check mark media that was covering Syria out of Gaziantep, Spooksville, Turkey, uh, the, the the Louise Lovelux and the Josie, the Liz Slies and Josie Ensors and all of these characters on down to the real rabble, the real losers like Patrick Hillsman and 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 Omar Az Katerji, who is writing, you know, ab- about magical Jew glasses for for uh, Vice, and it's really you know, you got to see him with no beard. It, it's great, you know. Before he was really this ferocious defender of human rights in Syria. Um, these people. Oh, wait, 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 here, here are some incredible classics, some more masterpieces from Omar Katerji, also known as Az Katerji. These are at, published at Vice. The strangely uplifting tale of the cam girl with no vagina. My friend got cir- circumcised. His mom and I went along to laugh at him getting part of his dick okay, cut off. Okay, put in the Jew glasses article. I mean, <laughs> what he- does Michael Fassbender's penis look like? Th- this is this is <laughs> this is the guy who fancies himself a Syria expert. Wait a he- minute. This is the guy who is called to testify on Syria by the House of Lords. <laughs> I mean, if you want to know what an operation is, this motherfucker was called by the House of Lords to testify. <laughs> No, put Oz or whatever. It's Oz Jew glasses. <laughs> okay. Put in the Jew glasses. I mean, this is the craziest shit that he actually got away with writing this. But then again, Vice was publishing articles back in the day on how to uh, fuck black strippers. Can these... Yeah, there it is. That's it. Can these blurry... Gl- no, not the magic Jews. The other one. These. Can these blurry glasses stop this me perving cool. over women by Oz Katerji? Yeah. I think he had his name removed because he's so embarrassed by this shit. Yeah, here it is. Here it is. This is by Oz Katerji in 2012. Can these blurry glasses stop me perving over women? <laughs> if it's working for Orthodox Jews, why can't it work for me? Oh, that's him. <laughs> oh, God. This guy, no, no, stop, stop right there. He was called by the House of Lords to testify on Syria. <laughs> And he was sort of like put in charge of an operation to care oh, for God. refugees. And this is what he wrote. This is what he wrote. First things first, to get the experiment right, I had to ensure that I could match the levels of sexual frustration experienced by an extremely religious person. I didn't have time to convert, so I went for the quick fix and next a Viagra pill I found on the backseat of a, of the N11 to Hammersmith while wearing a pair of jeans that were two sizes too small for I me. I mean, it's almost a parody of Vice, and it's like you're so <laughs> trying to get ahead. This is 2012, wait. And then the Syria proxy war starts, and James Lemercurier comes out as your you know, white knight and gives you 
contacts mm. gets you into Syria. I mean, it's just so obvious who these people are. I mean, and, and all of them Follow come through. Follow Oz Vice. on Twitter at Oz Cotter G. Look at this there picture. It is. I mean, what, what the? <laughs> this is what he was reduced, reducing himself to. And now he's this so-called Syria expert who is called. Well, by no the one British thinks government. of him as a Syria expert, but he was called by the he British sure government. Certainly thinks. He and is. then you know, the day I was arrested, he says he wants to buy the cops a beer. Who shackled me to the floor? Um, you know, he's not just like taking the cops' words. He want, he's he's taking the cops out. And at, this at, is the worst part of all. Although these I don't people, think he'd do very well at like an Irish bar. These or whatever, people Irish smear club. us as authoritarians. They they libel us. They say we're dictator lovers. We're getting paid by dictatorships. It's all defamatory, legally act, actionable nonsense. And th this this is this bullshit. At the same time, they're the ones cheering on the Trump regime, which they claim to oppose. The Trump administration. Imprison, Let's not use Bob Avakian. Whatever. Rhetoric. But they're, I mean, it's hyperbolic, but the Trump administration is trying to imprison a journalist and it's clearly, it's obviously an apparent form of government repression in response to your reporting. Well, see, and they're cheering it on. Well, see what these clowns they're say. They're the about, authoritarians. See what they say about Julian Assange, who would face 150 years over here and get tortured. And who's being tortured right now, I mean, according to Nils Melzer, the UN Special Rapporteur on Torture. Yeah, so anyone... Uh, any one of them would be anti Assange, but they're the authoritarians. More recently, today, Nira Tantrum, <laughs> I mean, Nira Tandon, <laughs> went on Twitter and said that so many people that she admire have signed a letter to The Guardian d declaring that anti Semitism in labor is too much and that they cannot vote for Jeremy Corbyn. John Le Carre. Somebody, somebody, and Oz Catterjee. She names three people. One of them is Oz Catterjee. That guy talking about the magic Orthodox Jew perv glasses is someone that she admires. Put, put the tweet up. She can't even spell Oz Catterjee's name. He's a part of this letter in The Guardian. It just shows what an obvious operation this whole thing is, whether it's on Syria or the operation against Jeremy Corbyn. This character is in the middle of it all. And and meanwhile, by the way, here's Nira Tandon with Benjamin Netanyahu, who she invited to the Center Everybody for Everybody who Progress. watches this knows Nira Tandon I mean, this loves is, tyrants. No, it's it, the hypocrisy but she, is impossible But she's to now supporting, effectively supporting Boris Johnson. Uh, this was someone who would have been chief of staff in a Hillary Clinton administration. And, but, but, but how did Oz Katerji get on that letter? Like, how is he in all these places when he was writing, he was just fired from the daily mail while writing about, um, you know, teenage girls cutting up, uh, what puppies in the microwave. I don't know what it was. Here's, here's the letter at the guardian of Blairism concerns about anti-Semitism mean we cannot vote labor. Yeah. John Lacare is, if anyone cares about this author's opinion, ironically, he writes about uh, spook, spook dramas. No, exactly. Look at these people. Majid Nawaz a former extremist Salafi jihadist who's now just a neocon who works his well his, basically all of Islamophobic these Islamophobic think tank received funding from the British government all all of the Muslims you see on there except for I don't know Oz is like a Lebanese Zionist or something I don't know um, but you know all the Muslims you see there are from um, Quilliam which is a British state funded think tank that was basically being used against the Muslim community in the UK and Majid, Nawa Majid Nawaz helped fund it. And they also participated, they consulted on the Libya regime change operation. And we were an article at the gray zone about really quickly, just about how Majid Nawaz had this long interview with Sam Harris about how it was so bad that Obama didn't, didn't meet, what he said on the red line that he didn't bomb and overthrow Assad. So these are people basically advocating for the overthrow of a secular government to, on behalf of Al Qaeda and ISIS. But look who else is on here. Jimmy Wales. Like this is the most random group of people. Well, that's interesting because Jimmy Wales. Hardcore Zionist too. Well, Jimmy Wales, for those who don't know, is the founder and chief executive of Wikipedia. And uh, he's married to the former communications director for Tony Blair. A lot of the people on that letter have connections to Tony Blair. And Jimmy Wales has validated or defended Philip Cross, who is a very suspicious account. I mean, the person Philip Cross has been identified as someone who lives with his mother and is mentally disturbed, but he may just be the patsy for a wider operation. And what Philip Cross does is any anti-imperialist in the UK or the US, but particularly the UK, he vandalizes their Wikipedia page in a military style fashion 
doing 30 to 40 edits a day. Every day. It's, Every it's day. like a full-time job. If it, if it's, it is one person, it's probably a team, but it's it's full-time and work. And so Jimmy Wales was asked about it, like, will you stop this from taking place? And he said, no, uh, Philip Cross is, is totally legit. Um, he and actually also, commented on it. And also, by the way, Wikipedia doesn't forbid these large companies, institutions from uh, from intelligence services from editing Wikipedia. So we actually saw Naftali Bennett, the far Israeli minister, admit that they have a whole Hasbara team that, that works full-time editing Wikipedia articles. And also Chris Hedges did a really great interview on his show on Contact, and they talked about how government agencies hire With, these... Uh, Helen, PR- Helen of Destroy. And they, the, uh, these blogger who... These regimes, the these governments hire PR firms that just spend all their time editing Wikipedia. So this is what happens. It was sold to us as this anarchist utopia, this libertarian dream where anyone can edit it. And of course, what we end up getting is that it's just a bunch of spooks, intelligence agencies and governments and corporations that edit it. And then average people can't actually edit because all the, your, your article, and all, they're all, they all become flame wars and people right, vandalize them. Right. So they all become locked. So only a small percentage of these elites who are Spooks can edit the articles. Yeah, so um, Jimmy Wales, cre- you know, he, he what he did was he created a bulletin board for the elite under cover of a kind of crowdsourced encyclopedia. It was kind of a brilliant contrivance, and he, seeing his name on that letter really tells you what he's all about. Um, and you know, so anyway, kind of in closing, I, I, I just thank everyone out there for the solidarity and the support. Um, it really helped me through an, an agonizing ordeal. Um, and, you know, but there also were a number of people who declared that I was guilty before being proven innocent, um, who sided with the cops reflexively while declaring themselves sort of anti-authority um, and believe in sort of promoting democracy while wanting a journalist jailed simply because they don't agree with my opinions. That's really what it comes down to. And And your factual reporting. And and they failed. And this is not the only legal attack that we're facing right now. Um, We'll be updating more, but um, there has been a sustained and coordinated attack exploiting the legal system to try to silence us because no one can just stand up and out-argue us or beat us on the facts. Uh, and we're going to continue uh, winning. Yeah, we are. We're going to continue winning. And, and we're going to continue breaking the media blockade and doing the work that we're doing. I mean, we're going to double down because one of the most important things we've done this year, I mean, we're now in December, is to be able to go to countries that are under attack, uh, targeted with regime change, under attack by sanctions, and to tell the story of the people in those countries who are part of socialist worker movements that who are never heard from in Western media, who are never heard from in corporate media. And if they are, they're portrayed as, I mean, they're, they don't have voices, they're portrayed as auton- automata who are authoritarian tankies, and they're just dehumanized. And the, the idea that, you know, we were in Nicaragua seeing hundreds of thousands of poor people from across the country convening in the capital to celebrate their 40th anniversary of a revolution to overthrow a U.S.-backed dictator, 40 years of sovereignty, of independence, of freedom. And then you look at the way that if they are discussed in not even just mainstream corporate media, but in so-called left-wing socialist media, Jacobin Magazine, these places, they treat these people as if they're all authoritarians. They worship the dictator Daniel Ortega. It is so dehumanizing. And just, and we're not even giving these people voices. They have voices, but we're showing their voices in English to a wide audience here in the U.S. And th- and then hell falls down on us. Like there's just this well, they, avalanche of lies at all times. I, well, they well the I mean we they make the, the, they try to make us ashamed of being friendly with the Sandinistas. Um, you're, Sandinistas you're, you're, you're only allowed any... to be supporting the Sandinistas when they're out of power and they're fighting for their lives in the you know uh, forests of northern Nicaragua as guerrillas or they're fighting against uh, 
for fighting against contras and they're unable to govern. But when they're actually able to govern and they're building infrastructure and they're expanding electricity and water services to a largely poor rural population, when they're expanding medical services and providing free healthcare, when they're providing free higher education that we don't have here, we're not allowed to be remotely supportive of them. And there's this element of the pseudo left that hates the left in power. So if you hate the left in power, what the hell are you doing trying to get Bernie Sanders and Jeremy Corbyn elected? And how are you going to defend them once they do get in power? Um, and uh, it's ridiculous. So we're, we're just, we're not going to be cowed about that. And the other thing that we've been able to do, I think, is clarify for people what's happening in places like Hong Kong, um, what's happening in places like Bolivia, where there have been um, coup attempts and color revolutions that are absolutely not progressive, that are retrograde, uh, bourgeois, racist, and xenophobic, and to show the forces behind them. And it's very upsetting to people, I think, that we've been able to find um, that our facts fall on fertile soil. Um, but I, I would just say, you know, we're, we're, we face these attacks that I've never faced before, where I've, I've faced sort of some some mild physical consequence for them. Um, and people like Julian Assange, who I can't even, I can't compare myself to him, not comparing myself to him, but you know, this is someone who may spend the rest of his life behind bars for journalism. I mean, that's the era we're in. The stakes are high right now, but I see it as a sign of um, our success in a highly skeptical um, transpartisan public um, that just wants the truth. And so we really get our strength from the moderate rebels community, from the gray zone community. And, you know, we're building our community of journalists and we're just going to, next year, we're just going to, there's nothing that's going to stop us next year from continuing to do the work that we're doing. And we're going to keep growing. So you can see us here at Moderate Rebels and we're going to be posting stuff more regularly and, and be more disciplined about that. And you can also find we always have a constant stream of reports at The Gray Zone. You can go to thegrayzone.com. It's gray with an A. And you can see this report that I published going into the details about Max's arrest. But you can also just find lots of other reporting. And, and you can also see our colleague Aaron Mate has a show, Pushback. And our colleague Anya Parmpol just launched a show, Red Lines. So we're going to keep growing. We're going to keep saying the truth. And no matter what consequences we face, no matter how many obstacles are thrown in our way, we're still going to keep reporting the truth. Peace.